this <laughs> okay uh really sorry for the delay you guys um uh, if anybody wants to see ECMO, now's the time because we have seven ECMO patients in the CVICU. So, uh, I was a little busy getting <laughs> doing some things this morning, so I really apologize for uh, keeping you all waiting. So, I know a lot of you have been uh, to this class before. Um, I don't want to bore you. If I tell you all the stuff you already know, then move me along and ask questions and ask stuff that maybe uh, I haven't explained before or haven't explained clearly or whatever. So I'll, um, my style of teaching is just to start from the beginning, um, explain the abbreviations, because if you don't know what it stands for, you don't know what it means. And uh, if my mouth gets ahead of my brain, please let me know and interrupt and ask questions. Because this is, this is all about you guys. So just let me know um, what you, what you want to know. So uh, there are two, first of all, ECMO, ECMO is extra corporeal membranous oxygenation. It gets confused with echo, E-C-H-O. Sometimes people add an H in there, uh, all kinds of abbreviations. So ECMO is extra corporeal. So extra corporeal outside of the body, membranous using an oxygenator. Uh, to oxygenate the blood and also clear CO, clear CO2. I'll explain all the parts in a bit. There are two types of ECMO. VV is venous venous and VA is venous arterial. And it is VA, venous arterial, because the blood comes out of the venous and back into the artery. It's not AV. So I'm going to talk about VV ECMO first. Uh, it's a little bit easier to understand and then we'll build, uh, build on that for, for VA. So VV ECMO is only for respiratory failure. The, and the reason for that is the, the cannula. So the cannula is a two, a big double lumen cannula. This one has this stylet in it. And it can only go in the right IJ. So the way this cannula works, it has holes here and here, takes, uh, sits in the heart, takes blood out of the heart and the IBC, takes blood out of the body, goes to the oxygenator, to the pump, to the oxygenator, and then back into this cannula through this hole. And I'll pass the cannula around in a minute. And the cannula has to sit this way with this arm forward because the way this hole sits at the tricuspid valve. So you, if you look at the heart from the right, from the side, the right side, here's SVC, here's the right atrium, and I'm a terrible artist, so hope this makes sense. Uh, here's the IVC, tricuspid valve, and the right ventricle. So this cannula goes into the IJ, into the SVC, and it sits in the body like this. So the blood from this hole is in the IVC, blood out of this hole comes from the SVC, comes out of the body into the circuit, and then jets back in here to the tricuspid valve. So you have to have a functioning right ventricle. If you don't have, if you have heart failure and you're putting this, the blood flow into the right side at four plus liters a minute, the RV is not going to be able to pump it to the, to the left and you're just gonna get a distended RV and then you're gonna be in a real bad heart failure. So you have, it can only be respiratory. You have to have biventricular function. And so on the, as uh, troubleshooting, um, the cannula, the arm has to point forward because the curved arm lines up with this hole that goes to the tricuspid valve. So in transport or in positioning, if it turns and the, goes to the back or to the side or something and blood's coming out of here, and I'll exp I'm just explaining mechanics right now, I'll explain all the physiology later. But if the blood comes out of here and just kind of hits the back wall and cir circles around, you're gonna get recirculated oxygenated blood. It's not gonna go forward. So part of the MCS nurse positioning and troubleshooting, this arm 
faces forward on the patient's jaw. So uh, VV, orally respiratory failure, the position of the, it's a single two-stage cannula, uh, two, excuse me, cannula. Um, still cannot be, uh, you can't be acidotic, so we shoot for a pH of 7.4. And uh, CO2, and again, I'll explain all this later. Uh, CO2 is uh, normal, 35 to 45. And on respiratory, we usually shoot for 40 to start with. Later on, we'll let it go up a little bit higher. Uh, when we put, if you ever go to a place and uh, you're there when we put ECMO in, and I think somebody went to LDS with me one time when we put ECMO in a patient, but as their blood is coming out of the cannula, when we're first starting ECMO, the patients get hypovolemic and they can arrest. So starting, um, when we're starting it up, if you increase, uh, you want a free flow for um, LR, NS, whatever, um, and lots of volume to start with. These patients are sick. They're you know, using all their catecholamines to try to keep a blood pressure, to try to keep blood flow. So the minute we take the volume out of them, uh, it's not uncommon, uncommon for them to uh, arrest, actually, to, uh, to start with. Any questions on venous venous? Can that cannula, does it have to go in their neck, or can it go in their groin? This cannula can only go in the neck, because the way it's positioned. The other way you can do VV ECMO, which we don't do very often, and um, is you can do a cannula in the groin and one cannula in the neck. So what they'll do is a very long cannula, and this is we use this one a lot for the AFMO works the same. So this long cannula goes in the femoral vein and up into the IVC. So it sits right here, and then there's a shorter cannula that can go. The shorter cannula they can put in the IJ. And some places that don't have echo, because this needs to be placed under fluoro or echo because it has to be positioned properly. So smaller hospitals that don't have an echo tech or an anesthesiologist or doctor, whoever, who's doing the echo, um, they, they'll just put these in. So you have the blood coming out of, blood coming out of here and back into here. So you're going through the tricuspid valve. But the problem with this is frequently the cannulas get placed too far. So now you're having oxygenated blood come out of this cannula going directly into this cannula. So positioning can be really tricky with these. The placement isn't as hard, but the positioning is. So you, you can do femoral and IJ VV ECMO, um, but most places if they have an echo person, then they'll do uh, this single lumen. The problem with this cannula is the hepatic vein branches off right here. Whoops. <laughs> and depending on the size of the patient, if you uh, you can sit them up with this cannula, but if they sit up and it smushes their liver then the cannula can easily flip into the hepatic vein. And as it's pulling blood in, this is much smaller. And you'll hear me talk a lot about the term suck down. And what that means is the pump spins RPMs up to five, 6,000 times a minute. So if the pump is spinning and it's pulling blood into the cannula, if the, if the uh, vessel is really small, then the vessel will suck into the holes, kind of like if you're sucking a really strong chocolate shake through a straw and the, and the straw collapses or you can't get the, sh the shake through the straw. So the, the vessel will collapse around the holes and then you don't get blood flow and your flows drop, your oxygenation, your oxygenation drops. So fairly positional, uh, works great when it works, works really great when it works. Um, I think that's about it for VV for now. I'll go back and forth for in a minute. So VA you can use uh, for 
heart failure, biventricular failure, or, <laughs> or just RV failure, because you have to have blood from the right to the left, or combined um, respiratory with heart issues. Uh, my favorite joke that I tell about uh, VA ECMO is we, uh, one evening, night, whatever, the CVIC got a phone call, and, the re and this is where abbreviations, I harp about abbreviations in all my classes, but uh, the resident got a phone call and they said, oh, we need VA ECMO, and he's like, this is not the VA, this is the CVICU. <laughs> and they said, no, we need VA ECMO, you know, there's like, I think it was MICU or somebody calling, I don't know. Uh, no, we need VA ECMO. And he's like, I am not the VA resident. I am in the CVICU. And the charge nurse overheard him. He's like, uh, are they talking about ECMO? He's like, yeah, this is not the VA. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> got to understand all the, all the things. <laughs> so, that, could, that could cause some troubles. I'm sorry. I feel like we should be, is this a true story? It is a true story. Well, you're yeah. not the VA, but you are pretty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so VA ECMO, there's so many ways that you uh, can cannulate. Oh, so don't laugh at my drawing, this is uh, terrible. Uh, this is your heart, here's your aorta, uh, FVC, IVC, um, IVC branches, clear down here. Uh, to the femoral, femoral veins, and then head vessels coming off. Totally not anatomically correct. So I'm going to start easy. Um, somebody who's had who's had surgery. They're in surgery, heart surgery. They can't come off the heart lung machine. Their lungs are bad. Their heart's bad. Both are bad. Whatever. So in surgery, the cannulas we use are this one. These two cannulas. So to go on bypass, it's just kind of like ECMO. You need blood coming out of the body and blood going back into the body. So the surgeons will put this cannula into the uh, right atrium, similar to uh, this situation, except it'll actually go in, they'll put a, poke a hole in the right atrium, put the cannula into the atrium, and it'll sit in the heart. I'll grab that in a sec. It'll sit in the heart like this, taking blood from the IVC, blood from the SVC, out of the body. So this cannula is already in the uh, right side of the heart. And then this cannula goes into the aorta right here. So arterial blood returning into this cannula. And the aortic valve sits right here. The coronary ostea come off and perfuse the coronary arteries again not anatomically correct. So the venous cannula sits here, and it's non-oxygenated, and it goes to the bypass. The arterial cannula sits here. It's oxygenated, oh, that's a two, and it's from the bypass. So that is just fancy ECMO. Uh, the heart-lung machine in the OR is just fancy ECMO. Blood comes out and blood goes in. The reason, so as the blood comes in to the arterial cannula, I should have done that red, but the blood comes into the arterial cannula and it goes to the body because the way the aortic valve functions, it's three leaflets, and the leaflets are curved. So as the blood is ejected from the ventricle, the valve opens, blood comes out, and then as the as you know, the pressure on the aorta gets higher, and so the blood pushes on the le on the curve of the leaflets and closes le the leaflets back. So if the heart is failing and can't strongly contract and eject, it's not going to push blood out of the aortic valve, and the blood coming in from the cannula is going to be a stronger pressure than the blood coming out. So it keeps the aortic valve leaflets. Uh, collapsed because of the pressure here. So blood doesn't come out of the ventricle. The great thing is, is that it perfuses the coronary arteries very well, and it perfuses the head and the rest of the body. 
So it's normal-ish uh, circulation, and it works. It works great. So that's from heart surgery. They're coming out of the operating room. These are the guys uh, we fly, you know, somewhere to to pick up that they can't get them off bypass in the OR, and their their chest will be open because, of course, in surgery, the chest is open and the cannulas are in, and they're coming out of the chest like this. So they can't close the chest because they'll smash the cannulas. So that's why you'll see lots of patients, several patients, with an open chest. If they have time, they'll do some finagling and do new cannulas and tunnel them through the skin and then just whip stitch the skin closed or close the sternum a little bit. Depends on how much they're bleeding, they can't do that. So you'll, when you pick up patients who are from the OR and their chest is open, that's why, because these cannulas are poking out of their chest. Uh, other ways to, any questions about that? Makes sense. Other ways to um, do femoral, or do VA ECMO, because a lot of our patients aren't from the OR, they're from the ED or uh, cath lab or something else. So we have femoral cannulation is next. So I'm gonna say there's central cannulation. And that's from like the OR. And then femoral cannulation is the next easiest. And that's ED or cath lab. Or if you're in France, off the street. <laughs> So the cannulas we use for that, somehow we have to get blood out of the body. So there's this long cannulas. This one is a size 28. It's the biggest one we have, and that's diameter. The smallest one is a 20. And it's based on body size and flow. So this cannula has a long stylet in it. This one's a, this one's a 22. So you can see the, the difference. They're about the same length, but the diameter is, is much different. So the cannulas have a stylet. They put a needle in the vessel. They put a wire in the needle, pull the wire out, and then thread this over the, the wire. It can go in either, either leg, uh, left femoral vein or uh, right femoral vein. And it goes all the way up to the right atrial SVC junction. It sits like that. And then they'll pull the stylet out. So these holes sit all the way up like this. And then, so it sits right here. Then you have to have arterial blood going back in. So there's this cannula. It looks very similar to the one we use when, with central cannulation, but it's longer and it's smaller. Uh, Maybe you don't care, but it makes it, it's important. It's important to know uh, because this goes into the femoral artery, and it's usually on the opposite side of the vein, but it doesn't have to be. They like it to be on the opposite leg because if you have both cannulas in the same leg, it really causes a lot of pressure uh, distally. Sorry, this one's up. This one's down. It really causes a lot causes a lot of pressure on the vessels, and so it decreases flow to the leg. So they like to do one on one side, um, one on the other. This cannula is, uh, the way it works, goes into the femoral artery, and I should have made a bifurcation. Went to nursing school, not art school. <laughs> so this cannula goes into the femoral artery and you can see that it's not very long. I mean, you would think the arterial blood needs to be higher, but if it was longer and it uh, went up into the aorta, it would actually occlude the branches coming off, so you wouldn't get flow. So if the tip of this was way up here, then these vessel, the branches coming off the aorta down here wouldn't get flow. And it's skinnier because you don't want to occlude the aorta. So how does it perfuse? It's very simple plumbing. You can see that this part is a bigger diameter than this part. So blood comes in 
quite forcefully into here from the pump. And just like if you were playing with a hose outside, if you're just holding the hose, the water would just come out of the hose. But if you put your thumb over the end, it squirts farther, right? Everybody knows you've played with a hose before. Somebody <laughs> grew up in an apartment one time and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, so anyway, it increases the, as it goes from a larger lumen to a smaller lumen, it increases the pressure. So it'll squirt clear out into the aorta and it'll perfuse the head vessels and it'll perfuse the coronaries. You don't have, it's not too big, so you can get, and we frequently have, distal flow issues to the leg, um, but a lot of times, uh, most of the time it works great. The thing that's the problem with this is where it gets tapered, it's so easy to back out of the leg. Do you have a question? You're, so, you're fine. Okay, just so I, know, I just didn't He's want just to ignore saying you. hi to you. That's fine. I saw he had a cast. That's fine. I saw he had a cast, but I just didn't want to ignore you either. It's Hold just it a up. stroke. Don't worry about it. I won't call it. We're not concerned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you have a question, use your other arm. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the b problem with this is that it can back out. You have. You know, RPMs are forceful, the flow is forceful, it can be four or five liters a minute. And if it's not secured, and even if it is secured, we have had this cannula back out quite a bit. And so the holes are very distal, but you just need one little hole out of the artery and pretty soon you're gonna see a huge uh, hematoma. So uh, checking this, the MCS nurse is supposed to put a, a line somewhere either across here or you know across the top somewhere to mark the insertion distance so they know that it hasn't backed out. It's usually more of a problem later like a couple days later when they're starting to diurese and you know they're now that they, when you picked them up they were this big because they're so edematous because they've had lots of fluid they're trying to save their life giving blood and whatever and now they're getting better so they're diuresing and the holes are getting smaller and it, and it starts to back out but it is something to um, be aware of that this one can back out right where the, the taper is. Uh, we have fancy securement devices for these. So those are the two main ways we cannulate. But sometimes it's, you can't access that way. The femoral, uh, you can't access the femoral artery, the vein is bad, whatever. So just so there's, just so to uh, confuse you, we could also do uh, axillary, femoral, so you, uh, so you do axillary artery and femoral vein. Um, the same cannula, you'd have the long femoral can, uh, venous cannula, but then they would put that uh, arterial cannula in the axillary artery. Just a lot of other ways to do it. So it's important to know cannulation. The, um, for the MCS nurse, it's important to know where they're cannulated before they leave to go pick them up because we need to know about various things. So we are, uh, we're one of the first nurse-driven ECMO transports in the country. And why are we special? <laughs> why could we do it? Uh, why doesn't somebody else do it? People have been doing ECMO longer than the University of Utah. And why is that? And it's because the, C, the SICU originally and then CVIC nurses trained with the mechanical support devices that we use in the unit all day, every day. And it's just, one, this is one example. This is the Centromag. I usually bring uh, the Rotaflow, but they're all in use. So this is our Centromag. It's very small, it's very portable. The Rotaflow is a little bit taller, uh, a little bit heavier. But we, we use these all the time, every day, um, from the OR, uh, everywhere. A real ECMO machine is about this big. It's huge, and it has lots of pumps and lots of pressure things and lots of bells and whistles. And a lot of the ECMO programs in the East use giant, um, not semi-trucks, but big ambulances are kind of like semi-trucks, I guess. Uh, to transport their patients. And so we didn't think it was a big deal when we started transporting these because we use them all the, all the time. And that's why um, 
we the nurses do it. The perfusionists uh, can set the devices up, but the perfusionists don't run the um, mechanical support devices in our ICU. Whereas in other uh, hospitals, the perfusionists or the ECMO programs are perfusion run, or in some hospitals, respiratory therapy runs them. And the nurse just takes care of the patient, not of the machine. So uh, the perfusionist or the RT would take care of the machine. But in our ICU, the nurse does the patient care and the machine care. Um, so that's, I've had lots of people ask, well, why is it okay? And that's okay, we just, it's just, a normal day at the office, <laughs> so is what we say, normal day on the job. So how does it work? So this is the circuit, and you'll see it lined up later when we load, but it's made up of two things, and it's a mess. So, oh, thank you. This is what I do normally. <laughs> Help the wizards. <laughs> Is there a spider in that little thing there? Okay. <laughs> so this is just the priming bag. This part is not here when it's connected to the patient. But you have uh, this piece. This is the venous. I'll just lay it down here in a second. Would you mind moving over just a little bit? So sorry. Thanks. <laughs> so you have this piece that's, you can see the blue under here. So this is connected to the venous cannula. So blood comes out of the patient comes through the balloon tubing into the pump. And again, you'll see this setup later on. The pump is connected to the uh, arm on the centromag, and it spins, pushes blood through the oxygenator. The oxygenator has this green tube on it that's connected to oxygen. And it, no matter, well, the, we call the oxygen sweep. So the flow of the oxygen coming into the oxygenator is set by liters per minute and we base it off of their CO2. So the sweep, no matter what it's on, if it's two liters a minute or 10 liters a minute, the FiO2 is always 100% because it's straight oxygen coming in. The main way, the way the oxygenator works is the part, the pressure differential of the oxygen coming in the tubing in here are hundreds, thousands, billions, I don't know, these little teeny tiny tubules. So the blood comes into here, the blood circulates around the tubules, and the tubules are so thin that they act like alveoli, and the oxygen can pass through the alve alveoli, do gas exchange with the CO2, and then the CO2 comes out as condensation out of the bottom. And when we're very first setting this up and their CO2 is high, you'll see like a puddle on the floor. So when you're picking these patients up, if you see clear fluid coming out of this, don't panic. It's just the, the CO2 condensation. It is quite alarming because you're like, oh my God, why is this thing leaking? But it's just, it's doing its job. And as time goes on and their CO2 is more stable, then the condensation gets less and less. But starting out in the, in the ICU on the floor, you'll always see a, a puddle underneath. So the sweep is going into here, goes into the tubules, the blood circulates around the tubules, oxygen goes on, CO2 goes off, and then you have oxygenated blood coming out of here. So hopefully this is dark and this is red. That's one of the things we assess to make sure it's working properly. Um, oxygenated blood coming out of here, and then this end is connected to the arterial cannula, so it goes back into the patient. So it's fairly simple. Uh, blood comes in, blood goes out. There's various stopcocks on here that we use in the ICU. The nurses also can run um, CRT, continuous dialysis, off the ECMO circuit. And then uh, these stopcocks for testing, uh, doing blood, blood checks, um, just to make sure the oxygen here is working right. So main things you're gonna look for, don't bash anything, uh, those stopcocks off, because blood will squirt out everywhere. Uh, they need to be off to the circuit. Um, this one here, this one is easy to hit. And then this one, uh, for um, all exciting things, if you take this off and it's connected, blood, uh, it's not doing it now, but if it's on the pump, blood will squirt out of you. So this big red thing does kind of, <laughs> you know, it's high point <laughs> So blood will actually totally squirt out of, out of there. 
It's like a Slayer concert. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, uh, worst things that can happen, something breaking off. We walk our patients with ECMO. We have had a stock cock break off before, maybe two or three times. Uh, and it's fixable. Um, if air gets into the venous side, we can de-air from here, so the, the air will come out. And it's no reason to panic until the air gets all the way down to here because you don't want air going into the arterial side of the patient. But there are various uh, troubleshooting things that the MCGS nurses do, and uh, it, there's always tubing clamps, and they'll walk you through it um, if it happens. Pre uh, preferably, you should have maybe a little discussion, like in the airplane or uh, ambulance or helicopter on the way, saying, hey, if this happens, do this. So I would suggest that you ask, what can I do if something bad happens? Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll set this up later. That was, that was proof that I was here. <laughs> you get credit for that. Because I'm so photogenic. So uh, the, the things that we look at, if they are femorally cannulated, we, need, we prefer a right radial art line. And the reason for that is if the arterial blood is coming into the femoral artery, and it has to go all the way around here. This branch head vessel comes to the right arm. I'm really good on this. So this, if you had a radial art line, this is the farthest away from where the blood is coming in. So if the ABG on the arm looks good, you know that everything else is looking good too. You know the head's getting blood flow, you know the organs are getting blood flow, because this is the farthest, the farthest away. Uh, you, we cannot have femoral, in femoral cannulation, we cannot have a femoral art line, because if the femoral cannula was here, and the art line was here, then you would be getting perfectly beautiful blood from the ECMO circuit going right into the art line. So you would think that everything looks great when actually up here you're not getting enough flow and the lactate's going up, or you're not getting enough flow and your head vessels aren't getting any, any perfusion, or the coronaries aren't getting perfusion, perfused. So uh, if we're somewhere and they don't have an art line and we ask for an art line, we'll, we will frequently ask for a right side. If anybody's in the ED, when we do ED ECMO, we always ask for the right side because of femoral cannulation. Uh, so the things we look at on the gas, things we look at on the gas. So our pH, 7.35 to 7.45. So the middle is 7.4. We, we don't want to be acidotic especially with VA ECMO, because the myocardium does not like acidosis. So we use a lot of bicarb, and frequently get the argument, the discussion, well, ACLS doesn't use bicarb, but the myocardium cannot be acidotic. And even if, the, even if bicarb... Kathleen? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. I raise my hand, my beautiful hand drawing. So bicarb, the reason why people argue about bicarb is because it breaks down into water plus CO2. CO2 is acidotic, so presumably giving bicarb increases acidosis. It's a big fat lie. I see it all the time, that works great. So we're gonna shoot for 7.4 for our pH. And then CO2, uh, it's cleared by the, the circuit, so we're going to increase the sweep based on the CO2. Normal CO2 is 35 to 45, so we're gonna, if they're acidotic, we're gonna shoot low to start with, and then we'll st 
still want them to be between 35 and 40 as long as they're really sick. So we're going to shoot, shoot for this. Uh, O2 on if the oxygenator works great. They'll have a, a PaO2 in the 200s sometime. That's fine. Uh, we start worrying about the oxygenator when the PaO2 gets to about 80. So we're, we're watching that, but you know, it'll be high a lot of times. Um, so bi bicarb normal is 22 to 26. That's what we're shooting for. And we base our bicarb on the base excess. So let's say you pick up, you pick up a patient and they're 725, their uh, bicarb is 12, and their base excess is negative 16. So in our equation, we could give up to eight amps of bicarb because our, our um, ECMO protocol is for every negative two of base excess, we give one amp of bicarb. I'm just gonna say sodium bicarb. Ugh. <laughs> Um, that I'm not saying we will give all eight, but our rule of thumb is for every negative two of base excess, if they're acidotic and if their bicarb's low, for every negative two of base excess, we'll give an amp of bicarb. And that's until they they are no longer acidotic and no longer uh, their bicarb's no longer low, and as long as their sodium doesn't get to like above 150, 160. When you're given all that bicarb. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's essential that you have to make, I mean, we are ventilating them here, but if it was just a regular patient, you just got to make sure that they're ventilating it off, right? Because then it will go back to acid. It can, yes, absolutely. Uh, but on with the ECMO, with the, the sweep and blowing it off, that's why we're not it. worried about it. Right. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but we need to temporize the pH, we need to temporize the acidosis, because the myocardium cannot work if they're acidotic, and we need the myocardium to contract just a little bit. It doesn't have to eject, but they, it, the myocardium cannot be asystolic because the blood the blood will clot. How quick are you giving them? Are you like, have you pushed yep. in the bag? And Pushing it, yeah. If you oh, have, uh, you know, people sense. frequently ask about a bicarb drip, but if you're hypoperfused, the liver and bicarb has to convert in the liver. So if you're hypoperfused and you're just doing a drip, it's not gonna, uh, flow through the liver fast enough to convert. So we give a um, whole amp, 50 milligrams, milliequivalent, milliequivalent, yeah. <laughs> 50 milliequivalents of bicarb fast, gets to the liver faster and it, it will convert. But if you're just doing a, a drip, it takes forever. It's not gonna, it does not work. Um, and then the next thing is uh, calcium. We like it to be greater than, oops, greater than 1.1. If the patient is hypotensive, we will push it to 1.2, but it, it needs to be at least 1.1. Uh, and our ECMO surgeons say uh, no one ever dies of hypercalcemia, so just give it. If you're, if you're hypotensive, they, um, calcium will help. And lactate, they're gonna have a lactate, it'll eventually come down. Uh, we don't want them to be hyperglycemic if they don't have to be. And potassium, that most of the time their potassium is a little on the high side, but that will clear a lot of times with flow. Did forget anything? So that's the gas, uh, what, we're, what we're looking at on the, on the gas. So as far as vital signs, And your art line and your swan and everything. So when I go pick up patients, if they have a swan, sorry, rude. <laughs> when I go pick up patients, if they have a swan, I cap off the ends and I say, don't worry about it. You don't need to transduce the pressures. The reason for that is the swan goes right here and it's, goes into the pulmonary artery. But if you're femorally cannulated, this cannula is sitting up next to the swan and it's taking the blood flow into this cannula. 
So you don't have normal flow across the swan. You're not going to have a normal CVP. You're not going to have an index. You're not going to have normal PA pressures because you don't have normal blood flow going across the swan. The way the swan works is the thermistor it has to have a temperature change from one beginning of the thermistor to the other. So the swan is uh, pretty much useless in ECMO except for a reason I'll talk about in a minute. So there's no reason to transduce the pressures. They're not going to be, they're not going to mean anything. And we frequently see that they are, the numbers are treated inappropriately because people don't understand, outside docs and whoever uh, don't understand why, why we're not treating an index of 1.1. Well, you don't have flow going across the swan, so you don't, you're not going to have a normal index. Kathleen, you may not, you may not know the answer to this. I don't know, maybe Dustin knows. Um, but do we still need to transduce the PA the PA on the swan if we're going at going to altitude to make sure that it doesn't get permanently wedged? No. Because you're not going to have a normal waveform, which I'll talk about. No, 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 but if just because of the air. No, you're not okay. going to have, yeah, okay. you're not going to be able to tell anything. Okay. I'll have to explain it in, okay. in a second. Yeah, it's a really good question. Okay. So the swan, you're not going to have normal uh, waveforms because you don't have normal flow going across it. The normal swan waveform has a CVP waveform that looks like this. And then, because the holes are in the uh, CVP, and then the blood going across the tip of the swan with your PA waveform looks like this, kind of like an art line waveform. But if you don't have flow going across, the pulmonary valve is not going to be opening and closing, so you're not going to have this. What you'll have is something that looks like this. So you're going to think it's permanently wedged, but it's not. And if it, uh, the, based on the measurement, the MCS nurses know that they can pull it back if they need if they need to. There's no harm in pulling it back if you're ever worried. But this is what your CVP waveform is is going to look like. Uh, excuse me. This is what your Swan waveform, your PA waveform, will look like. So if the, the CVP hole is right here on this one, and it normally looks like this, but it's going to look like this. So you're not, that doesn't mean anything. You're going to have a number that says 10 over 9, 9, 4, 5, 4, whatever. And then your art line, you're going to have a right radial art line, and normally Everybody knows the art line looks like this. A little dichrotic notch. There's supposed to be a dichrotic notch right there. Because the dichrotic notch is the opening and closing of the aortic valve. But if you have cannulas taking blood out of the heart and putting it in the aorta, there's not enough blood coming out of the ventricle. It's not going to open and close the aortic valve. So you're not going to have a dichrotic notch. If the heart is contracting, You'll have a waveform that looks like this with no dichrotic notch. So you're going to have a waveform. If the heart is barely contracting, you're going to have an arterial waveform that looks like that. And you're, you're going to say, something's wrong with the art line. I don't know why I don't have a pressure. We're going to need another art line. This isn't working. And the MCS nurse is like, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And the reason it's fine is because it's so far away that the heart's can barely contracting and blood still has to, you know, uh, vibrate, <laughs> go through the aortic valve a little bit and somehow get into the uh, arm. But as it gets farther and farther away, it loses the vibration of the heart contracting and so you have non-pulsatility. All of our ECMO pumps are centripetal. They just spin. So there's no pulsatility in the pump. You just have blood flow rushing by. So you just have this. So how do we know that the heart is contracting? I said it has to contract. It doesn't have to eject, but it has to contract. It, you cannot have a systole. And the way we know that is just by looking at the swan 
waveform to make sure there's something like this. So it is perfectly okay to have a flat heart line, but it's not okay to have a flat CVP. Because even if the heart is contracting just a tiny bit, the CVP hole is right there. Or I always get myself in trouble when I say this. Or the PA hole is, <laughs> is right there. <laughs> so if the heart is barely contracting, you're going to have some sort of vibration on your waveform. Sorry. <laughs> I said it accidentally one time, and now I just have to say it because it's fine. So you're going to have some, no matter what the heart is doing, you're going to have some waveform in those two, even if you don't have an art line uh, waveform. So I don't know how many pressures you, how many pressures can you transduce on those? Three. Three. Three, okay. So I would, it, um, obviously the art line pressure, and one of, one of those, just so you can see, if the art line is flat, then you should transduce. If the art line is flat, then you should transduce the, either the CVP or the PA. But you're not looking at numbers. Numbers mean nothing. You're only looking at the waveform. You're only looking for pulsatility. On the art line, so if this was a normal blood pressure, this is systole, so your systolic pressure is 140, 120, 110, whatever. And diastole, over 80. If this is your ECMO waveform, you're going to have 80 over 60. If this is your ECMO waveform, you're going to have 70 over 70. So it's not your map by any chance, is it? It is your map. Oh, Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> so Get that man a big brain. Excellent. <laughs> 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 you win a prize. Treat yourself. So on our ECMO patients, we only go off the mean pressure, and our goal is a mean pressure of 65 to 75. So 80 over 60. Let's see, 120 plus 80. Divided is 200, divided by 3 is what just is under 70. Thank you. So that's a good pressure. This is a good pressure. This is actually too high of a pressure. So we'll pick the patients up, or you'll get there, and they'll be on norepi and epi and vaso, and they'll be stupid high amounts of these pressure, pressors. And as soon as we start ECMO, we'll be like, turn the norepi off, turn the vaso off, just leave a little tiny bit of epi. We just need a mean pressure of 65 to 75 and a little bit of contractility. So we'll leave the epi on. Even if their pressure's a little bit high with epi on, we'll um, actually start ni nicardipine sometimes because we don't want a mean pressure of 80. We want the ventricle to rest. We don't want it to squeeze. It doesn't need to eject. It just needs to con contract. So we uh, frequently will turn uh, you know, the minute we start epi, um, I'll be like, okay, you don't, you don't need to do that one. You don't need to prime that one. You don't need to bring, to bring that one. So this is your goal that you're shooting for. And I know that's not a normal pressure, but we, you know, if you look at a blood pressure of 110 over 70, you may think that that's low or, you know, 110 over 60 is low, but that's a mean pressure of like 86. And so that's too high on your, on your, on the ECMO patients or a heart failure patient. You really just want them, want them to rest. Um, is that going to be your mean CVP on the top, so that can give you an idea of fluid status? No, not really. Okay. Because if the if the cannula is sitting right next to the CVP um, measuring blood flow port, changing. then you're not going to have blood flow going near there. Or if it's stuck up against if the if the swan is stuck up against the side of the cannula, it's going to look like it's high. So we don't look at numbers on the uh, swans when we have ECMO patients. We truly only look at the waveforms. We don't, we don't treat the numbers. We don't do anything with the swan numbers. We don't connect it to the CCO machine. We don't look at index. We don't look at anything. The only thing we're looking at as far as flows is the ECMO machine and the, R the RPMs 
and the flow. And the flow is cardiac output. So because it's centrifugal, we'll have, let's say, um, RPMs of 50, 35, 60, let's say. And the flow is 3.5 liters per minute. But your patient, so this is RPMs, but your patient is um, 100 kilos and 180 centimeters. Is that enough flow for your patient? This is equivalent to, to what? Liters per minute is what? You need to call Cardi in one of the CBICU nurses to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. Liter, so liters per minute, it's an easy question. I'm not I'm making it sound hard. It's just your cardiac output. So cardiac output, you know, you, the book tells you, okay, normal cardiac output is five to eight liters a minute, four to eight liters a minute. But we don't really go off cardiac output, we go off cardiac index, because cardiac index is based on body size. So how do you convert cardiac output to cardiac index really quickly? Uh, just to <laughs> just, yeah, friend. just to give yourself a, an idea of what's going on. I carry the bag. So there's a big, <laughs> giant formula to figure out cardiac index, but mostly just assume that if they're a normal-sized person, they have a cardiac, uh, excuse me, they have a BSA. There's a big formula to figure out BSA, but if they're a normal-sized person, a normal BSA is two. And what that is is, and this is my crude way of explaining it, if the body is cut in half this way and open like a book and rolled out on the ground in a centimeter thickness, it's two, it's two meters squared. So a normal BSA is two meters squared. That's on the floor, a centimeter thick. So the formula doesn't really cut you in half, but whatever. Uh, so just assume if they're normal size, their BSA is two. If they're big, their BSA could be 2.2, 2.4. If they're little, their BSA is 1.8. So two is a good number to go off of. So if this dude's BSA is two, and you're gonna divide the cardiac output by BSA to equal cardiac index. So if his output is 3.5 and you divide by two, what's the index? 1.7. Normal cardiac index should be greater than 2.2. So we will adjust flows RPMs to increase our flows to get a normal cardiac index based for that patient. But when we're doing that, increasing the RPMs, it also increases the risk of suck down. So that's when we'll say, hey, I'm having suck down, give some more fluid. I'm trying to increase the RPMs to increase flows so they can have normal perfusion. And a lot of times it, it requires liters of fluid. So uh, we'll bring quite a bit with this. Do you ever give blood? Instead of we fluid? do give blood, that's great. The next thing I was gonna say is we like a, crit of, a hemoglobin hematocrit of 30, 10 and 30. So if their hemoglobin is less, then we'll say, yeah, can we have some blood? Because these are primed with They're saline. primed with saline, yeah. So mm -hmm. their, their crit could drop, right? It can, guess after, after this is connected to the patient. So this right here is a liter of Normasol and once it's, the tubing is cut and it's the oxygenator's primed, it's about three to 500 that the patient gets. It's not a ton. It looks like a ton, but it's not, it's not that much. So it's only primed with a, a liter to start, to start with. But the fact that they vasodilate, once we take their, the pressure off their heart and the body and working so hard to keep themselves alive, they, they lose their catecholamine response, they vasodilate, so then they need more fluid anyway, and you can um, decrease their hemoglobin just with dilution from volume. So we will give blood for a hemoglobin, a hematocrit of 10 and 30. Uh, we like the heart to rest. So you'll get there, like I said earlier, uh, you'll get there and they'll be on 18 drips and you think, oh, I don't have enough pumps. <laughs> and, but most of, most of those will not be running once the ECMO is going or once they're not acidotic. 
tons of times we've picked up patients and you know we go there because the folks aren't uh, all the way familiar with running the ECMO so they'll not treat the acidosis they'll uh, cause cause acidosis with too much uh, like um, vasopressors so once uh, it's reduced um, acidosis is reduced then the drips work a lot better and half of them come off also we don't paralyze our patients when they're on ECMO and we want, to, we want a neuro exam as soon as possible after the arrest or event or surgery or whatever. So if, I, if I'm on a flight um, and the patient's paralyzed, I'll keep them paralyzed until we leave the unit, but I, I will tell you not to bring a paralytic. Uh, most of the time their livers are bad because of low flow state, so it takes a while for the paralytic to wear off. And we want to see a neuro exam. Uh, I have not yet had anyone flop about in the cabin because the paralytics have turned off. Uh, hopefully that I don't jinx myself, but they don't, they don't need to be paralyzed. They do need to be sedated, um, at least to start, and make sure they're resting, but uh, we don't paralyze them. We don't do uh, inotropes. They don't need to be on dobutamine. They don't need to, be, need to be on dopamine. The heart needs to rest. We don't want to make it uh, work harder. What questions do you have? What have I forgotten? So we had an admin review of one, uh, the last one, oh God, it was a couple ones ago, um, and about sedation. Mm -hmm. And the, our nurse asked the students about what, what we use, and they said straight up propofol, so they did not get any pain control during the flight. Mm -hmm. Isn't it propofol and fentanyl across the board? So it can be. If it's femoral cannulation, it's not that painful. Uh, and they can just be sedated. We don't necessarily infuse fentanyl all the time on the patients. Have you ever but been femorally cannulated? I have not. Well, but, what, what I'm but taught the thing is, is if any intubated patient gets pain control. Yeah, yeah so. and that's and that's great. It yeah. does not it doesn't hurt. But and but the <clears> other <throat> thing is is propofol is a vasodilator, it will drop their pressure. So if you're having pressure issues, then increase the fentanyl and turn the propofol off or at least down. Because enough narcotic is a sedative. So uh, I always lean towards less propofol and more of something else. Um, you can also push uh, fentanyl if, if they need it. Uh, I think on one flight we were short on pumps or short on access or something. And so I think maybe I turned off the fentanyl and was doing pushes or turned off the propofol and pushed Versed, one, one or the other, I don't remember. So you, you know, there, there are lots of options, but the patient should be comfortable. Uh, I picked up a patient from um, another hospital in the valley and they had an open chest from the operating room and they'd been in the ICU for at least 36 hours and they were uh, on a Versa drip, they were paralyzed and they were getting one milligram of morphine every four hours. Oh my so that is terrible. That mm -hmm. is, to me, that was malpractice. <laughs> so, you guys um, use ketamine? Not initially, no. We don't do ketamine. Not, uh, later on, yes. It actually not, puts not some initially. additional strain on the heart, doesn't it? It came that way. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But, uh, yeah. You can. They should not be um, have PTSD after the flight because they remembered everything. That's not good. If you had been to the CQI, I was invited to speak at. You would know. You don't put them on a ketamine drip. That's something that I try to avoid. <laughs> no one likes the one up and down. <laughs> What other questions? What yeah? What flights have you been on? What questions do you have? Tell me. Is things. the initial cannulation arrest uh, transient, or do you commonplace work these arrests for quite some time to try to resuscitate them? What does that look like? What um, should we be ready yeah. for so, if we're there assisting cannulation? So let's say it's BB. Um, the they'll hang on, they'll hang on, they'll hang on until. When we try to get, so the, the cannula has to go over a wire. So they put a neck in the IJ, a needle in the IJ, a wire through the needle, pull the needle out, and they're trying to get the wire down into the IVC so they can put the cannula through. The wire sometimes can coil in the right atrium and it'll cause VTAC. So it looks like they're arresting, but they're really not. Uh, so chest compressions on these guys sometimes are not the best thing, they just need to pull the wire out. But what, um, the biggest problem with VV is hypovolemia arrest. And that's after we start the ECMO. So I always try to have a free flow going when we start. 
Plus, they're usually, uh, because they're respiratory issues, they're usually dry anyway because you don't give lung patients a lot of volume. So the biggest thing on these guys is hypo hypovolemic arrest or both with manipulation of the wire and the cannula. So it is transient. That it, one it can be correct. transient. Yep. You're not yep. doing full rounds of ACLS no. on these patients no. when you're talking about that initial yep. cannulation arrest. Yep, on VA, or excuse me, VB. However, on ED ECMO, so someone comes in with a STEMI, they arrest, <coughs> or in the ICU, there's a you know cardiology patient, heart failure, working them up for a VAD or something and they arrest. We've done CPR, ACLS for well over an hour, hour 45 minutes trying to get cannulas in. And so those can go for a long time. We have good success with them. And it just depends on acidosis, how, fa how fast you get to them, what their, what their uh, perfusion is in the meantime. Mechanical CPR devices versus just hands CPR devices. Depends. <laughs> Depends. The the Lucas uh, sometimes gets in the way. Um, it bounces the patient a lot, and it's really hard to try to accurately put a needle in the femoral artery or the femoral vein when the Lucas is bouncing the patient around. Sometimes, in that case, um, hand is better than the mechanical device. And auto pulse yeah. with the bands. Um, I don't know. I've actually not seen that one. She says it's better. It has like a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's hands something. is better. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, because sometimes, yeah, I don't know. sometimes I don't you're needing that echo, and that yeah. stuff can get in the way too. Yeah, the the echo, so the echo yeah you have to have the echo with um, the. It's preferable to have echo with the yeah. cannulation. Okay. Yeah. So the VB ECMO, a VB ECMO arrest is strictly just CPR until they catch up with their preload, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then of course there's a whole other situation thrown in when they've already had heart surgery and they've had a sternotomy. We don't do ACLS, we do CALS, which is modified chest compressions. We actually open the chest and do heart massage before we'll do full on two inch <coughs> chest compressions. So if you're ever in the ICU, CVICU, and we are doing a, a, a coding a post-surgery patient, you'll think, what the hell are those people doing? Because we're doing baby compressions, we're only pushing 0.1 of epi at a time, you know, you don't want to blow their blood pressure sky high, and in the meantime, we're opening their chest. We're getting ready to open their chest. Um, depending on the, the cause, if it's V-fib free tack, we'll actually shock them three times first before we ever even touch them to do CPR. Stack shocks? Yeah. You brought them back? <laughs> yep, all the time. <laughs> People think we're crazy sometimes. Get flo nurses floating from other units and they're you guys don't know how to do ACLS. You don't know what you're, you don't know what you're doing. That's ACLS. <laughs> so, Hair okay. fissure me perfect. Here's the rest of this. Let's Why have a big round of applause no, no, for no, Kathleen. No, 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 no. Can we take can we take a yeah. like a five minute break? Yes, please do. Thank you. And then I'll talk hey. about why we have all these other things. Nurses.